one bit of seed there for us. There you go. So she's a refresher. Let's start hit number 231. Let's all stand. Oh, happy Let's day. Go. 231. visitors be sure and shake their hands on your way out this morning show ourselves friendly a lot of birthdays and anniversaries on the list we recognize those this morning in Sunday school so that's all you get if you weren't here you missed it <laughs> happy birthday the anniversary to all those folks uh, be in prayer for pastor again and his family while they're out uh, traveling and uh, for Miss Buell and Miss Phyllis um, call pastor and let them know that they have the flu, so be, keep them on your, uh, in your prayers. 
and I don't see Brother Bill, Miss Joyce here, so be in prayer for them as well. And uh, Brother June, Miss June, a lot, a lot of folks out. Hopefully, we'll pray for them as well. You know that they're uh, for their health and for uh, safe travels for those who are out and about. Um, some upcoming events: Father's Day, of course, June 18th, Ladies Fellowship and card making class on the 23rd. And uh, 25th or 27th of this month is Summer Revival with Evangelist Scott Pauley. My tongue worked this time. Uh, and then June 28th, Golden State Baptist College Tour Group will be here and singing for us. So be sure to keep those things on your calendars. And uh, we also have uh, Brother Kent York with us this morning and uh, will be out with us this evening as well uh, preaching while pastor is out. Let's start with a word of prayer. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, the safety that you've given us in our travels here today. Lord, we pray uh, for our visitors. Lord, that uh, you'd be with them, bless them, show them uh, yourself uh, through the preaching this morning. Lord, open our hearts and minds to the message. Be with uh, Brother Ken as he brings your word, Lord, and uh, just fill us all with your spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. All right, let's turn over to hymn number 536, He Ransomed Me, 536. <clears throat> Miss Julene too and Miss Cindy. So there's on my mind that are traveling as well. Uh, Brother Rick, would you say a prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you've blessed us with, Lord. We thank you for this church and the opportunity that we can come out today to hear from your word, Lord. We pray for all those that are traveling, all those that are away, and all those that are sick. Lord, you be with us today. Keep them safe, protect them, and return them to us. We pray now, Lord, for this uh, offering that you would bless it.
turn over to hymn number 202, Amazing Grace, 202. morning say amen. amen now look over to the person beside you and just say my you're good looking <laughs> now don't laugh hilariously after you say it it's good to be with you here at heaven's view baptist church this is my first trip here my name is Kent York, and I'm from the big old thriving city of Chickasha, Oklahoma, just 32 miles outside of Oklahoma City. And uh, your pastor honored me to invite me to be here. I was in the area and had the date available. And uh, so it's just good to be here and meet you folks for the very first time. I want to remind you right after the service i'll be standing in the lobby beside the table and i do have cds and dvds and some things like that but i also have a prayer card and i'd love for every one of you to get a prayer card and stick it up and pray for me when you think about me now i never ask anyone to put me on their prayer list i always just say when you think about me pray for me and so the way I help you with that is whenever you see a fat person pray for brother Kent York right then so if you ever see a fat person stop right then and pray for brother Kent York and if you ever go to Golden Corral I'll be flooded with prayers I'll tell you so uh, it'll be a prayer time but uh, anyway, you get a prayer card, and also uh, if you'd like to avail yourself to some of the resources, I have them on the table back there. Let's get our Bibles out this morning, and let's turn over to the book of Luke. Chap oh, am I not on? I thought I flipped it. Maybe I flipped it off. Now I'm on? Dang, I flipped. I, I went the wrong way. I'm sorry. Luke chapter 12. Go down to verse number 16. Luke Chapter 12, verse number 16. As soon as you find your place in God's Word, let's stand and we'll honor God's Word as we read it by standing. I love to honor that old book you got in your hand. 
I'm one of those narrow-minded preachers. I don't believe the Bible contains the Word of God. I believe the Bible is the Word of God. And uh, I believe every word of it. And I love to honor it at the beginning of the message. Luke chapter 12, verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying... Now the he here is Jesus Christ. He's going to share us a par- with us a parable. Now a parable is an earthly story but it most definitely has a heavenly meaning. I had a preacher the other day, I think he was trying to hurt my feelings. He said, Brother Kent, you're a skyscraper preacher. And I said, well, thank you. What does that mean? He said, your story on top of story on top of story. Well, you know what? That didn't hurt my feelings a bit. Because guess what? Jesus was a storyteller because he knew people could not understand the deep truths of the kingdom of God unless he illustrated it with an earthly story. And he is going to give us one of his greatest parables this morning. Let's read on. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, What shall I do? because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, (laughs) It's kind of weird. Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink. And be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're asking you right now to bless the reading of your word. You promised us that your word would never return void. And we're claiming that promise. We're asking you to take this passage and apply it to hearts. Lord, I'm praying this morning for a Christian in this room that needs this message. I'm praying for someone in this room that's never made Jesus king. They've never made Him leader. They've never made Him Lord and Savior of their life. I pray this morning they'd listen as never before. And today they might call upon the name of Jesus and be saved. Lord, give me clarity of thought. Give me holy boldness to be your preacher. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. This morning, Jesus takes a paintbrush. I don't know if you saw it in there, but he takes a paintbrush and he paints us a portrait. Did you see it? It was the portrait of of a fool. (laughs) A portrait of a fool. I don't know about you, I'm not in the habit of calling people fool. In fact, if you read the Bible, the Bible says, call no man a fool. But I gotta believe, if God called this man a fool, he really was a fool. Now, I know in my life, There's been times I'm pretty sure I've met someone that was a fool. Have you ever just, you know, I think I met a fool today. Uh Uh-huh. 
I, uh, I fly every week and uh, I go up to the airport with my luggage and uh, I go up to the counter at Delta and I put them luggage up on that scale and every once in a while one of those girls or guys they'll be punching a thousand keys and they'll look across that counter and they'll say, Mr. York, has anyone put anything in your luggage without your knowledge? Well, you know, if it was without my knowledge, how would I know? (laughs) Are you a fool? I was at a department store at Christmas time, and I was buying something, and I pulled out my credit card, and I signed a slip and gave it to the girl, and she turned and looked at me, and she said, Sir, I cannot accept your credit card. I said, Why not? She said, You didn't sign it on the back. I said, Well, give it to me. She gave it to me. I signed it. I gave it back to her. You know what she did? She took that slip in my credit card and compared the signatures. (laughs) I just signed them both in front of you. (laughs) Of course they match. Are you a fool? (laughs) Then there's been times that I felt like a fool. Have you ever just felt like, you ever done something just, you just felt like a fool? TSA came out with this new machine. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it, it, years ago they came out with it and it whirly magigged around you and took a picture of your body and burned all your clothes off of you and they were looking at your naked body, you know. Uh, and uh, they don't have the camera, or they don't have the screen right out there. Some guy's in a back room looking at this thing because you know he's back there laughing his head off all day long looking at these pictures. And uh, first time I ever saw one, I was in Gulfport, Mississippi, and I saw that that new machine, and I thought, I do not want to go through that. And so I'm a professional flyer, and I know how to handle TSA. Never make eye contact with them. Keep your head down and just keep moving. And I'm moving down that conveyor belt, and I want to go through that metal detector and not that whirly McGig machine. And uh, all of a sudden, I heard a guy go, Sir, sir. Come over here. We got a new machine. We want you to go through it. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm fine. I'll go through the metal detector. And they're like, no, no, you got to go through this. So you get in there and you put your feet on the footprints and put your hands up and it goes around you. And then you step out. And there was a guy, a TSA guy there, and he had a wire running out of his neck and he had an earpiece. And he's standing there. Stand right there. So I'm standing there and uh, I heard him go, what? You want me to do what? Are you sure? (laughs) And I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be bad. (laughs) And all of a sudden, he turns right in my face and he says, Sir, I'm going to have to touch you in some private area. I said, really? He said, if you'd like to, we can go do it in the back room. I said, no, I ain't going to no back room with you. Uh, No, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it out here in public. And I mean, he went to poking and prodding me and sticking me. I don't know what he was looking for. I think he thought this was all plastic explosives draped on me. I, he pushed every bit of blubber I had. I, it was the most humiliating thing. And I walked away and I just felt like a fool. You know, I've met fools. I felt like a fool. But this morning, we actually get to meet a fool. And that's what I want to preach on for just the next couple of moments. I want to look at the portrait of a fool. First off, I want you to know Jesus tells us that this man was a fool about his own person. Did you see the first part of that passage? He said... The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. (coughs) I will pull down all my barns and I'll build bigger. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. I want you to notice, this man was a fool about his person because in this passage, there's no reference to a family member. 
There's nothing in this passage about friends. There's nothing in this passage about neighbors. In fact, in the first three verses, he refers to himself, either by noun or pronoun, 11 different times. I will do this. I will do this. This is my fruit. This is a man who literally is worshiping at the altar of himself. Have you ever met a person that could strut sitting down? Mm -hmm. Here he is. This man is all about himself. And I'm going to tell you right now, we see it in the world we're living in. They call this the me generation because everybody is worried most about themselves. In fact, there's some of you right now sitting in this service, you can barely concentrate on this sermon. You know why? Because you're already thinking about what you're going to eat for lunch. You're already worried about what's on the television this afternoon. You're already worried about something else about you. Well, let me tell you something. You're important to God, but you're not the creator, you're the created. Do you understand that? We have people in our churches today. Everything's got to be about them. There'll be somebody when Brother Rowe gets back next week, he'll say, I didn't like that evangelist. <laughs> you know, he didn't even part his hair. Look at him. Uh huh. His forehead was so big he could put a second face up there. <laughs> he was kind of mouthy too. And the building, yeah, that's it. Uh, the building was too hot, and the building was too cold, and the pew was too soft, and the chair was too hard. You know, we constantly live with people like that in our churches. You know why? Because coming to church is not about reaching other people for Christ. It's not about being a blessing to other people. It's all about you. What do I like? I hear people come to church and they'll go, Well, I really didn't get much out of the service today. And I always ask, Well, did you bring anything to it? You know what I'm saying? That's this man. He was a fool about his person. Everything was about him. And we see people today becoming arrogant in their lives. Williams, when they translated this passage, said, Do not evaluate yourself above your true value. You know what? God loves you. But the world does not revolve around you. In Oklahoma, we can drive down the farm roads and every once in a while there will be a fence post and you'll look over and there's a turtle sitting on top of a fence post. You ever seen one of those? I guarantee you he didn't get there by himself. And I'll guarantee you, you didn't get where you are in life by yourself. When I was a student at Baptist Bible College years ago, they didn't allow us to have televisions in the dormitories. They thought we should just pray and meditate all the time. But it was the final game of the NBA playoffs. And it was late at night and we had to see that game. It was the L.A. Lakers against the Boston Celtics. And so we went out and snuck around and found a little 13-inch television set. We put it in a cardboard box and we carried it in the dorm. We went downstairs to our room and put it in the closet, opened the closet and cut a flap. We were down there late that night because the game was on the West Coast. I don't know if you remember that game. It got down to the last five seconds of the game. And the Boston Celtics were ahead by one point. The Lakers would get the ball and they would inbound it at the half course line. There was no doubt who they would inbound the ball to. Everybody in the world knew who the Lakers would inbound the ball to. The greatest basketball player that the Lakers ever had, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Now for you young kids, that's not a football player, that's a basketball player. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And that's another story. But anyway, <laughs> five seconds left in the game. They inbound the ball to Kareem. He dribbles up to the top of the key, turns and does his famous flick over the top. The ball is in the air. It gets right to the top and it go, the buzzer goes, nah! It was silent in the arena. It was silent in our dorm room. And the ball fell 
and went all net swish right through the middle. And the Lakers won by one point. Ah! We jumped on the bed. We're screaming. We're yelling. We couldn't believe it. And all of a sudden the door opens. And it was our floor mom. And he goes, you guys got a television in here. He closed the door. He said, you guys are in trouble as soon as the post game show is over. He sat down on the end of the bed with us. I remember people were running all over the arena and a cameraman and a, and a, a sports reporter ran up to Kareem and they stuck the mic up in Kareem's face and they said, Kareem, you've just made one of the greatest shots in NBA history. What do you have to say? And you know, I've thought many times since then what he could have said. He could have said, well, I'd like to thank God for making me seven foot tall because that really helped. I'd like to thank my mom and dad for raising me. I'd like to thank my coaches in junior high and high school and college. And I'd like to thank my teammates because they blocked everybody out so I could make the shot. But I'll never forget Kareem said, What can I say? I'm the greatest. That's what he said. And I thought, Kareem, you are standing on the shoulders of thousands of people that got you to that point in your career. And at that moment, you took all the credit. Well, you know what? I don't know where you are in your life, but I know this. You didn't get there by yourself. You're standing on the shoulders of other people. And this man was a fool because to him, the world was all about him. It was all about him. Me. And I see today in our churches that we've got people, we're just full of people, that it's all about them. And not a lost and dying world going straight to hell without Jesus Christ. Get your eyes off yourself. Secondly, and I think you need to understand, first you have to understand who you are. The second thing about who you are is your possessions. And I want you to notice this man was a fool about his possessions. He said, he said, this is all mine and I don't have barns that will hold it. I'll tear them down and build greater barns. He never thought about helping anybody. He never thought of a neighbor that was having a bad year. He never thought of some widows and some orphans and some people he could help. No, he was a fool about his possessions. They were all His. And I have to tell you today, in the world we live in, there's really three philosophies on possessions today. First is what I would call the pagan philosophy. The pagan philosophy is this. I want what you've got and I'm going to get it. <laughs> you know, that's the philosophy of the criminal. That's why they break into your house while you're gone. That's the philosophy of the crooked politician. And boy, we got a lot of them. They're just after your money. That's the philosophy of the pornographer today. Do you know that one of the leading pornographers in America was interviewed the other day? And they asked him, Does it bother you that the pornography you put out on the internet, that it desensitizes men against women? Do you understand that it degrades women? Do you understand it destroys young men's ability to have a happy marriage? Does that bother you at all? And you know what one of the leading pornographers in America said? He said, pornography puts food on my table and a roof over my head. You see, he didn't care how he got his money, just as long as he got it. That is a pagan philosophy. Thirdly, there's what I would call the perverted philosophy. And I'm very sad to say that's probably going to be the most widely held philosophy in this room. The perverted philosophy. The perverted philosophy is, I'm not going to take what is yours, but what I do get, I'm going to keep. I'm going to keep it all. You know the old saying, I'm going to get all I can, and I'm going to can all I get. It's mine. 
And there's some of you right now that you hold on to your money with a death grip. Why? Because you're a fool about your money. That is a perverted philosophy. And don't you dare go out of here and say, Brother Kent's some kind of communist that thinks I ought to give my money away. No, I'm not a communist. I'm a capitalist through and through. But I believe that every one of us ought to care for people and be generous and we ought to share what we've got. But I don't want the government to tell me who I got to give it to. In fact, to be honest, if you'd follow the biblical mode, churches take care of their own church members. The trouble is today, so many people don't darken the door of a church, they don't have a church to help them. So the government had to step in to do it. I've been in church all my life, and I'll be very frank with you, I've never seen a church member going hungry. I've never seen a church member go without because the church family is always there for their members and for their brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the biblical way. But the perverted philosophy, I've got it. And I'm going to hold on to it. I was telling them in Sunday school, you know what, if the Lord comes back tomorrow, every bit of money that you got socked away in the bank, the Antichrist will get it all. He'll get it all. I believe the Lord's coming back. There was some crazy evangelist several years ago. He was traveling around the country. He knew the exact date the Lord was coming back. Went around all the churches. I know the exact date the Lord's coming back. And I've got all my bills paid off. I've got my house paid off. got all my credit cards paid off. The last payment will be the day before the Lord comes back. I thought, how stupid that is. <laughs> if I knew when the Lord was coming back, I'd charge everything up to the hilt and the first payment come due the day after the rapture. <laughs> I'd dump that right on that Antichrist. You know what? It's a perverted philosophy when you've got a grip on your money. The third philosophy is what I call the proper philosophy. And the proper philosophy is this. Everything I've got belongs to God. Isn't that a simple philosophy? <laughs> that house I live in, it belongs to God. That car I drive, it belongs to God. That money in the bank, that's God's money. If he wants it, he can have it at any time. I had a preacher friend and they had a family in their church that didn't have a car and they couldn't get to work and they couldn't make a living. They didn't have a car. and So the preacher got up in the pulpit and he said, Hey folks, we need to start praying for this family to get a car. They need a car. And the preacher said, Little did I know that God wanted them to have my car. <laughs> and that preacher gave that family his car. He had a brand new car. He gave it to this family, a brand new car. And I asked him, I said, Preacher, how do you give a brand new car to somebody? You know what he said to me? He said, Brother Kent, it only hurts if you love it. <laughs> you know what? Giving only hurts if you love it. The proper philosophy is everything I've got belongs to God. But this man, he was a fool about his possessions. Thirdly, we see that he was a fool about his pleasures. Look at verse 19. He says, and I will say to my soul, and this is weird, soul, he's talking to his own soul, thou as much goods laid up for many years, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. You see that little phrase there? Eat, drink, and be merry. Doesn't that encapsulate everything we call today as having a good time? You see, first he says, I'm going to eat. Boy, isn't food a good friend? Don't you love food? Doesn't food make you feel good? Some of you are thinking, yeah, if you shut up, I'll go get some. <laughs> I got a date with some food right now. I got a best friend in life, and you know who it is? Lemon pie. Oh. <laughs> Me and lemon pie, we're like this. We love each other. That always makes my wife so mad when I say that. 
She thinks I love lemon pie more than her. Just half the time. But anyway, food's a good friend. Food satisfies the body. Do, do any of you ladies, do you, ever, do you ever get a little depressed, a little discouraged, and you're driving by that QT station, and you know there's a good friend that lives inside that QT station? You know who he is. Mr. Ho-Ho. Mr. Ho-Ho. He lives in there. So you go in there, and they always come in those two packs, you know. And when you put it down on the counter, the cashier looks at you like, you going to eat that? And you're like, oh, my kids like those in their sack lunches. Oh, okay. Then you get out in your car, and you put up those tinted windows, pull over to the corner. <laughs> Didn't Mr. Ho-Ho make you feel good? Oh, you know, that's what food does. It satisfies the body. So he says, I'm going to get some food and I'm going to eat. And then I'm going to drink. Now, this is not a reference to water. He's not thirsty for water. This reference of drink here is actually an intoxicating beverage, something that has moved in the cup. You see, he's not interested in quenching his thirst. He's interested in changing his mind. And you'd be very sure. People don't drink because it's delicious. And they don't drink because it they taste so good. They drink because they want to affect their mind. They try to inebriate themselves. Who would go down to Walmart and buy a 24 cube of Coke and sit down and drink every one of them watching a football game? That'd be the stupidest thing you ever heard of. But you know what? Many a man or woman will buy a 24 cube of beer and they'll sit down and drink every one of them watching a football game. Why would you do that? You're trying to change your mind. You see, I've been in the ministry 41 years, and I've dealt with alcoholics and drunks my whole life. And guess what? Every one of them drinks for one reason. They're trying to drown their problems. And I got news for you. Your problems know how to swim. Mm -hmm. It don't work. He says, I'm going to drink. I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to eat and then I'm going to drink something that's going to affect my mind. Then he says, I'm going to make merry. If you go into the root form of this and study it, the word make merry or make merriment here in its root form has a sexual connotation. I'm going to satisfy my sexual desire. Now, I want to stop for just a minute and think about this. Eating, drinking, and making merriment, is this exactly what the world today calls having a good time? Partying hardy. Yeah! Oh, I'm going to get me some chicken wings and some pizza, and I'm going to get me some six packs of bud. And I'm going to get my girlfriend, my boyfriend, and we're going to party down. That's exactly what the world today tells us is having a great time. And guess what? God called this man a fool. You're a fool. Now, I know I'm talking to a Baptist church and some of you are sitting there and you can amen because you're like, well, brother, again, I'm a Baptist and I don't, I don't drink and I don't smoke and I don't dip and I don't go with girls that do. <laughs> but you know what? Us good, faithful Baptist Christians, sometimes we need to stop and say, what brings me? the greatest amount of pleasure in my life. Is it golfing? Is it fishing? Is it crafting? Is it garage selling? Is it watching sports on TV? I'm going to tell you, sometimes we're just as big a fool as this guy was. 
because we find our pleasure and our fulfillment in things that are other than Jesus Christ, other than the Word of God, other than living for God. Jesus says, this man was a fool about his pleasures. And then lastly, and I'm done, I'll let you go. I want you to notice he was a fool about his predictions. Go back to verse 19 again. What does it say there? And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for, what does it say? Many years. The truth be told, he wouldn't see the sun come up the next morning. He wouldn't see the next day. But his prediction was, I'm going to have this for many years. He was a fool about his prediction. Let me tell you something. The Bible says life is but a vapor. It's here and it's gone. And I travel all over the world and I talk to people. I can find a 15-year-old girl and say, Honey, how long are you going to live? Well, bro, I'm going to live at least 100. Maybe with new medicine, I can live to 115. That's true. Then I can find a dear little old sweet old lady, 88 years old. Honey, how long are you going to live? Well, I'm still a kicking. Isn't it amazing? Nobody's dying tomorrow whether you're 15 or whether you're 88, we're all going to live. But the truth be told, people are dying every day. Read the obituary column. They're dying every day. And not all of them are old folks. Many are young people. You see, you have no guarantee of another day. And Jesus said this man was a fool because he thought he had many, many years. My number two son, Ben, he's now a pastor in Columbus, Ohio. But he was our youth pastor several years ago in Chickasha. And Ben used to like to take the teens out on Monday night and they'd knock doors and witness. He loved to go door knocking with the teens. It was late in August. Ben had a boy with him and they went up on a porch and they knocked on the door and a big old strapping boy came to the screen door. He was a head taller than my boy. His name was Cody. He was 17 years old. Ben quickly asked him if he was saved and Cody said, no, I'm not saved. Never been saved. And Ben said, Dad, this boy was brutally honest. He leaned into that screen door and said, Sir, I don't have time for you right now. I'm on the football team and I'm starting this Friday night, opening night. I've got my school work. I've got my friends. I'm a senior in high school. I don't have time for you. And if I would go to church, I'll go someday with my mother. Ben said, Well, Cody, I know you're busy and I understand you're tied up for time, but if you just give me a minute, let me tell you about Jesus and how you could be saved. You know you need to be saved. Sir, I don't have time. He wouldn't listen to Ben. And Ben and that other boy walked off that porch and left Cody at the screen door. Friday night, Cody was starting at the Chickasha High School football team. They were having two-a-day practices. On Thursday, when Cody went to the morning practice, he felt nauseated all morning. Went to school. By the time they got to the afternoon practice, Cody was still sick and he collapsed on the football field. He didn't lose consciousness, but our coach was concerned enough. He called an ambulance and had them take him over to our little hospital. His white blood count was high and he was running a fever and he was nauseated. They didn't know what was the matter with him, so they transferred him to Children's Hospital in Oklahoma City. His mother was a beauty operator, and she shut down her chair, and she got in the ambulance and rode to the hospital with Cody. 
Cody didn't get to start the football game Friday night because he was still in the hospital. In fact, he stayed in there all weekend. And to everybody's shock, every day, Cody didn't get better. He got worse. And at 4.30, Wednesday afternoon, Cody died. 17 years old. A big, strapping football player. You see, he stood on that porch with my boy and told him, I don't have time for this. And if I do go one day, I'll go with my mother. And the boy didn't have 10 days to live. Cody was a fool. As far as we know, he never did call upon the name of the Lord. I feel like God sent somebody down there to tell him. Gave him one last chance. And you know, this morning I stand up here. I've never been to this church, never been to this town in my life, but God brought me here. And guess what? He brought you to be here this morning. And this morning, if you've never called upon the name of the Lord, you've never been saved, you'd be a fool to walk out of this building without at least coming and finding out how to get saved. The Bible says that if you could confess that you're a sinner, that you could believe that Jesus died on a cross for your sins, Not as a martyr and not as a good man. He died as a substitute for you. He paid the penalty of your sin. And the Bible says we need to believe that they buried him. And on the third day he arose from that grave. He resurrected. And today he's seated at the right hand of the Father to make intercession for you. The Bible says if you can believe in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and you would call upon His name, the book of Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 says, Thou shalt be saved. Isn't that easy? Isn't that simple? But you know what? Some will make a prediction, I'll have more time later. And there's no guarantee that you'll ever wake up tomorrow. There's no guarantee you'll ever be in another service like this and you'd be a fool to reject Jesus Christ. Jesus says, this man was a fool. Don't be a fool. Be wise. In just a moment, I'm going to have an altar call. I call it an invitation. You know why? Because I'm going to invite you to come down. We've got men with Bibles. We've got ladies with Bibles. They're trained, and they can show you how to pray and how to get saved this morning. And you could leave this building knowing, if I died tonight, I'm going to heaven. I don't have to be a fool. I can be saved. Would you stand with me this morning?